Okay, so I think we're going to go ahead and get started, um, and others will join as we go along. My name is Susan Sikekwaptiwa. I serve as the assistant agent for the, um, the Hopi Tribes Federally Recognized Tribal Extension Program. It's part of the Cooperative Extension System. Um, I just serve the Hopi Nation up in Northern Arizona. And um, I've been in this position for about three years now. So part of our job is to bring uh, the U of A's College of Ag Science to the community and to help guide you and, and support all your ag efforts that you have. I just wanted to let everyone know that uh, this is the first series in the set of right now four sessions that we're planning on poultry. We're really happy to uh, have you all here. This workshop was really designed for people who already raise chickens. But if you're anything like me, you like study the heck out of it before you do it. This is perfect for those who are like sitting on the fence wondering, should I do it? Can I do it? You know, those kinds of things. So um, I'm really happy to introduce my colleague, Ashley Wright. She is an extension specialist who uh, is so knowledgeable in this area. Um, we have so many great people in our, in our uh, community of extension who can offer a lot of great, uh, great resources. So she will be teaching the class tonight. And um, I'm going to turn it over to her here in a bit. Take it away, Ash. All right. Thank you very much, Susan. Can you guys hear me okay? Good. Awesome. So thanks very much for inviting me. I really enjoy talking about poultry. I raise chickens for eggs myself. And anytime I get to share pictures of them and talk about them, I'm super excited. And uh, so the reason you're seeing my friend Colt on there is that he and I actually do a lot of poultry stuff together, even though he is now at the University of Maine. And so we came up with this little logo um, for all the things that we've been doing, talking about poultry. So today um, we're going to talk about raising chicks um, to be productive laying hens. We're going to talk a little bit about um, how we pick chicks, um, you know, what breeds we might want, how we can successfully raise them in, in our brooder situation, and then a little bit about nutrition kind of for all life stages of poultry, starting with those chicks and all the way through when they start actually laying their eggs. Um, and like Susan mentioned, this is the first um, in a series of four webinars that we have planned. Um, next month, we're gonna talk about coop design, housing and predator management, really a big issue here in Arizona. We have a lot of predators and everything likes chicken. Um, in April, we're gonna talk about poultry diseases. Um, in May, we're going to talk about egg production and kind of egg safety, um, and, that, and, the, and then we may find we have another one we want to add after that, but those are the four we have planned for right now. Um, so today we're going to talk about sourcing those good healthy chicks of the appropriate breed that we want, making sure we have them well set up in our brooder, and then that nutrition for all life stages um, of, of our egg laying hen process. I'm going to keep it pretty focused on egg laying hens today. If some of you are interested in meat birds, um, we can maybe consider that as an additional one and I might be able to convince Colt to come on and talk about that because uh, he's really good with the meat birds. That's something he does a lot of. So what are some things you need to know about raising your own chickens if this is something you're not into right now? Um, the pros, it's really easy to find and really easy to get rid of chickens if you decide you're not as interested as you thought you were. There's always people interested in taking them. Um, they're a relatively small investment compared to other livestock species. Those meat production um, birds especially have a really short production cycle. Um, chickens are fairly efficient. They're good at assisting with insect control. Um, everybody loves fresh eggs and maybe even meat if meat birds are what you might be into. They can help improve manure and soil if they're allowed to free range. They're just fun. And then finally, we can actually offset some of the costs of raising them by selling excess eggs. This is legal in Arizona with what's called a nest run license. And I'll talk a little bit about more, more about that when we get to the egg production um, webinar. Um, in Arizona, that's fine. If you're in another state, um, you may need to check with your Department of Ag to see what you need to do to be legal there. And of course, there's some cons that go along with raising chickens. They do take a little bit of time and effort. Um, infrastructure, I feel like in Arizona especially, is a little tougher than other states. We need to make sure that we have that really good coop that um, predators can't get into, and I actually just had some predator losses um, over Christmas that I didn't catch, that I had some wood warping and, a, and an entrance was made and a bobcat found its way in. Um, so just making sure that we spend the time um, to, to build a solid coop is really important because they will exploit any weakness that we leave those predators. 
Um, there's a potential to attract mice and other rodents, but we do have some ways we can mitigate that as well. Um, death losses are always sad and attracting predators, of course. Depending on location, and a lot of you guys are, almost all of you are up north, um, winter care can be maybe a little bit more intense, maybe a little less intense for me. Um, I forgot to introduce myself. I'm down in southern Arizona. I'm actually based in Cochise County, but I live in uh, Vail, just in Pima County. Um, so for me, winter care is not a big deal, but for you guys up north, we have some considerations around um, freezing temperatures and that sort of thing. And we'll talk about that when we get to housing, um, I think is the next webinar. Diseases, um, there's all kinds of diseases that chickens can get, um, but that we also have some good ways to combat most of them. Potential for noise, um, chickens, when they lay eggs, like to do their egg song and they can be a little loud. If you don't have neighbors, that's fine. Roosters are loud. If you're intending to raise um, chicks, you will need a rooster, but if you're just raising hens for eggs, you don't need one. Um, and typically with all these costs considered, um, unless you're in this for the long haul with a fairly big contingent of hens, it's typically cheaper just to buy eggs. Um, that's assuming that you can find them though. Um, I do know that this year there was that big, a big run on them and, and the grocery stores were pretty low when COVID was sort of at its peak. So. Um, so let's go over some quick basics about laying hens. Um, the first term you're gonna hear me say quite frequently today is called pullets. And a pullet just refers to a young female chick. And it just, literally just means a female chick. So when I say a pullet, I mean a girl, a girl chicken. Hens usually begin laying eggs between 18 and 22 weeks of age. So it takes quite a while to grow these baby chicks into a hen that will actually be producing eggs for us. Um, and hens don't have an unlimited supply of eggs. Like all animals, they're born with all the eggs they will ever lay already housed within their ovaries. Um, eventually they will run out. Most have between four and 500 eggs that will be able to develop, become part of the egg yolk and, and be laid. Um, if we do a little bit of quick math on that, if we assume that the chicken lays an egg every single day, um, she has about 56 to 72 weeks of egg production in here. So that's two to three years. However, most hens don't really lay an egg every day. The, the egg cycle is really 24 to 26 hours, maybe even a little bit longer in some of our breeds that weren't bred for high egg production. Um, and we also find that production will not happen consistently throughout the year. So um, during the winter time, um, when the, when the light, unless we provide supplemental lighting, their production will decrease. If they go through a molt in the late summer, early fall, when they shed out their feathers and grow some new ones, they'll generally stop laying temporarily then. And then in the spring, if they decide they want to hatch out chicks, whether they can or not, they will go what's called broody. Um, and generally that means they're trying to sit on a nest of eggs to hatch them and they'll stop laying during that time as well. So with all these factors sort of taken into account, um, really we're looking at three to four years of productive life out of most hens. Um, and also the other factor is that production will decrease as the hens age. So when they hit about 30 weeks of age, so about eight to 10 weeks into after that initial egg laying, they will be at what's called peak production, meaning they will be laying the most eggs that they will be laying every day throughout their life. And every year after year one, we find production decreases by about 10%. So, so year one, they'll lay 100% of the eggs that they're genetically programmed to lay. By year two, they'll be laying about 90%. And by year three, about 80%. So we find that production slows down. Um, and as I said before, uh, roosters are not necessary for this process unless we intend to hatch chicks. If we're just looking for eggs for consumption, we don't need a rooster unless we want one. Uh, so picking, picking breeds um, for, for laying hens. There are over 150 breeds of chicken um, in 340 different color combinations. There are as many different chickens as you could ever imagine. So rather than going over all of them, which would take us forever, uh, I'm gonna go over some factors you might wanna consider, maybe give you some of the most popular recommendations, but you can certainly do some internet searching on any breeds you're interested in to see if they might work for your, um, for your situation for egg laying purposes. So before you decide what breeds, um, determine your purpose for keeping poultry. Is it primarily for egg production? Are you wanting to produce just some eggs for yourself, for your family? Are you wanting to produce some eggs to supplement or offset costs, so some extra eggs to sell? Are you looking for a lot of egg production or are you more interested in that chickens are sort of just fun to have 
and the eggs are kind of a side benefit. All those things are going to factor into that. Um, again, books, magazines, the internet, all really great um, to read about these. All the hatcheries that, that are online that sell chicks um, usually have descriptions of the breeds and will tell you approximately how many eggs per year they lay, that sort of thing. Um, start small, a little smaller than you think. Um, a, few, a few hens, maybe four or five is usually enough to keep a small family with plenty of eggs. Um, so order a manageable number for your situation. Springtime is usually when you find chicks. Here in Southern Arizona, that actually starts as early as February. Um, for you guys up north, it may be a little later. It may be more like March or April before you start seeing chicks in the feed stores, but that's a good time to start. So when we talk about laying chickens, some of the most popular breeds, the, the, the number one breed is the leghorn, which is actually the commercial breed that lays those big white commercial eggs. Those really actually aren't recommended for backyard flocks as much. They do tend to be a little nervous and flighty and just not that personable. Um, and some people have a lot of trouble getting them to lay consistently because of that. So I'd recommend looking a little further down this list. Rhode Island Reds are very popular, Wyandots, Orpingtons. The Americanas and the Easter Eggers are the ones that will lay like the green or the blue or the pink colored eggs, kind of depending on what their genetics are. Morans lay a beautiful chocolate brown colored egg. Um, Australorps, Plymouth Barred Rocks, um, Sex Links, which we'll talk about a little later when we get to chick selection, are also interesting, but again, there's many. So when you're looking at the, the um, online, when you're looking at these breeds and looking at the things that they um, say about them, um, a good rule of thumb is a really good laying breed will lay about 280 eggs per year, and that's kind of how that they'll report that. Um, anything that lays more than about 200 eggs per year is a, is a pretty decent layer, um, if you, especially if you're looking at those more heritage or dual type breeds. There are some breeds I think would probably be better avoided if your goal is egg production. Um, so number one, those Cornish crosses, those are meat birds. They've been bred specifically for high growth and to produce a really big carcass that is perfect for meat. However, they really don't lay much, if at all, and they don't really do well if you try to keep them alive beyond their intended lifespan of eight to 10 weeks. Um, they just aren't meant for that. They were just, they were bred to be meat birds. So I really don't recommend those if your goal is egg production. These other breeds are bantam anything means that they're tiny and certainly they make great pets. Um, but they're going to lay tiny chickens, are going to lay tiny eggs. Um, so that's just something to keep in mind. This is a Polish chicken um, with the, the cool head feathers. Um, silkies, cochins, any of the other ornamental type breeds, um, a lot of them lay infrequently. They may lay less than 100 eggs a year, which is really not very many. Um, they make great pets if that's what you're interested in is having them for fun. Um, but don't count on them to contribute or pull their weight in the egg department because they will not. And the age old question, how do you tell what color eggs a chicken is gonna lay? Um, if you take a look at those earlobes, this is not a hard and fast rule, but as a general rule of thumb, the white chickens with those white lobed ears are gonna lay white eggs. The chickens with the red lobed ears are going to lay a brown egg, um, or in some cases a purple or a, a turquoise bluey green egg, or the Moran's lay that chocolate color. Um, there is no nutritional difference between brown and white eggs. They are exactly the same. The only difference is that as that egg passes through the shell gland um, and out, it will get um, a dose of color put onto it by the, by the chicken. Um, and, it, and it only is the outside of the shell. It doesn't color anything else. And it's completely determined by the genetics of the chicken that is laying the egg um, by nothing else. Um, and we'll talk a little bit about that in the, in the egg webinar too. Um, yolk color is generally determined by what you're feeding them. So chickens that are eating a very, um, a diet that's composed pretty much of just commercial feed and they're not getting any free range type stuff will have a lighter colored yolk. Whereas a chicken who's able to forage and find some insects and other things will generally have a darker, more orangey colored yolk. Um, again, the nutritional value, yes, no green eggs. <laughs> the nutritional value is pretty similar um, to these anyway. Um, you'd, have, you'd have to do quite a lot of manipulation in order to make your nutritional values significantly different, and then you'd probably have to eat a lot of eggs to make it make a difference to you. Um, brown egg laying hens are generally bigger hens, um, and they do generally cost a little more to feed. I do have a little feed breakdown towards the end. Um, the white egg hens are most cost efficient, but um, 
for most of us producers, um, it, I think it's fine to have whatever you want. Um, I prefer a variety of eggs. I have a variety of breeds. I have green eggs, I have blue eggs, I have moran eggs, I have light brown eggs, I have speckled eggs. You name it, I have it. So um, whatever you prefer. The one consideration that's gonna make a big difference is if you are selling eggs and you want to sell uniform eggs, you are probably gonna want to get some uniform chickens of the same breed so that you're getting very uniform eggs. So where do I buy chickens? Let's say I've, I've figured out which breeds of chickens I kind of want. We have some considerations to think about. Um, number one, buy, you wanna make sure you're buying healthy birds from somebody who's practicing good biosecurity. And that means that they're making sure that their birds are free from disease, so that you're not bringing diseases in, that they're free from things like salmonella, um, which is something that can be um, transmitted to you. Um, if you kiss your chickens, don't kiss your chickens but that's how people can get it. Um, the ability to sex chicks. So um, chicks are very, very difficult to tell if they're male or female, okay? Um, it takes like a professional trained, I can't do it. It takes like a professional trained person to do it. It's, it's not an easy thing to do until they get all their feathers. Once they get all their feathers, it becomes fairly obvious. Uh, but by then they're eight, nine, 10 weeks old at least. Um, and you've invested some time and feed into them. So. Um, these hatcheries do sex their chicks and you can buy all girls. Um, there will be a few boys that slip through. It's like 95%. It's not perfect. Um, but that's a consideration as well. And then are they NPIP certified? So the National Poultry Improvement Plan um, certification um, does help produce, help these chicken producers to test their flocks for things like salmonella. Um, any e. coli to make sure that their flocks are free from these diseases. And generally somebody who's participating in NPIP is raising good quality birds with good biosecurity practices. Um, so many of the large scale hatcheries, you can order directly from them through the mail. And we'll talk about shipping chicks in a second. Um, you can also purchase chicks at your local farm or feed stores. Generally they have ordered through these large scale hatcheries. That's where they're getting, not all, but most of their chicks. Um, the caveat I would say with them is just make sure that there's somebody there who is doing a good job with the care of the chicks after they've gotten them. They're not mixing groups from different hatcheries. They're not mixing age groups that came in at different times. They're not allowing the public to handle or touch these birds because that could potentially spread disease. I know everybody wants to pet the cute little chicks, but that's just a good biosecurity practice that we don't allow people to touch them. Um, so, so as long as they're doing those types of things, you're probably going to have good luck with those birds. Um, there are also pullet producers, uh, people who literally raise pullets up and will sell you a pullet who is close to or is laying. Um, and that's one good way to make sure that you get all girls. Um, and then there are a lot of local producers and hatcheries who are doing a really great job, some local breeders um, who, who do great job with their chickens. Just always be sure that you're asking questions, pay attention to what you're buying, be aware of the biosecurity concerns. Um, and also be very aware if you're purchasing birds um, someplace like a farmer's market or a similar venue where any place where birds from different places, different hatcheries, may be mixing before you take them home because that's a potential for spreading disease. Anytime birds from different sources mix um, or co-mingle. Mm -hmm. um, so just be aware of that if you do choose to purchase from one of those venues. And so we've thrown around a few of these key terms, but let's just explain them really quickly. So pullets, those are our female chicks. Straight run, if you see a pen of chicks marked as straight run, that means that they are unsexed. They could be boys, they could be girls. I find in my experience, they tend to be maybe slightly boy heavy because they've maybe padded the pullet pen a little bit from, from this group. Um, if you see a pen of birds marked as sex linked, that's actually a breed of chicken where they've actually bred that breed to have different colored male and female chicks. So they will come out with completely different feather or down patterns. And that really aids in proper sexing. So if you're buying sex linked birds, you are very likely getting all pullets. As I mentioned, those um, sexed pullet groups, there's about a 5% error rate on those. So out of 100 chicks, 95 of them will be pullets and about five will be little boys who they thought were little girls and turned out they weren't. Um, and then finally, that MPIP is that Natural Poultry Improvement Plan. So chicks by mail, this is something that you can do. You can order them. So chicks, um, right before they hatch, the last thing they do is they sort of absorb a bunch of nutrients from that yolk in the egg. 
And they actually have about 48 hours where they don't need any food or water. So they can be overnighted through the mail. They send them in these little cardboard mailers with a little like pine shavings in the bottom. Um, so they need to be shipped quickly. They'll generally overnight them. I would never order close to a weekend, like, and especially a holiday weekend. If something happens with the post office and they get hung up somewhere, it's not gonna be good. Try to order on like a Monday or a Tuesday, maybe a Wednesday at the latest. Monitor the weather conditions. We don't wanna be ordering maybe when it's 110. We also maybe don't wanna order when it's 30. Um, and be ready to pick them up as soon as the post office calls you and tells you that they're in. Um, have your brooder, and we're gonna talk about brooder set up in a minute here. Have your brooder set up, ready to go, so that when they, as soon as they get home, Take those chickens, those little chicks, sort of dip their beak in the water to kind of show them where it is and then put them in the brooder. Make sure they have access to food and water um, and a heat source also. And this is done pretty commonly. So the thing with ordering by mail is um, you will probably have to order a minimum amount. Most of them won't ship fewer than, than 10 or 15, I think usually. It might be maybe five, 10 or 15, I think usually. And part of that is that they do kind of cuddle together for warmth. Um, with each other. And so shipping too few becomes a problem if they don't have enough buddies to keep each other company. Um, but you could always go in um, and order with a neighbor if that's what you wanted to do um, to make sure that you guys get chicks straight from the hatchery if that's what you want to try. So uh, brooding chicks is what we do when we raise those chicks up from being um, chicks up through adults. And we start out by putting them in what's called a brooder. And really what all a brooder is, is a clean, dry, ventilated, safe area um, that is protected from predators and other things. It has a heat source because chicks do need to be kept fairly warm. It has a light source for during the day. We need to keep that daytime, nighttime light cycle. And again, we wanna make sure we have this set up before we bring our new chicks home. So some things that have successfully been used as brooders, cardboard boxes, plastic tubs, kitty swimming pools, um, aquariums, water troughs, wood boxes. The, I'm, I'm a big fan of the horse water trough thing. Um, dog crates work very well as well. Anything that's really secure that will protect those chicks so they can't get out, protect them from kids, from pets, cats especially, um, predators if they're outside. We want to protect them from drafts. We want to protect them from extreme cold, extreme heat, etc. Um, my favorite is a wire bottom dog, like the full wire dog kennel. And then I actually use cardboard to enclose the sides halfway up and that completely protects them from drafts um, and allows, but still allows plenty of airflow. Um, so the big consideration too is where you're gonna put that brooder. Um, if you're gonna put it someplace not climate controlled, like a garage outside on the porch in maybe in the chicken coop and it's in its own little separate area or something, um, it's really important that we pay attention to making sure that our temperatures are correct, that we're minimizing warm and cold spots, and that we're blocking drafts. And if we're keeping um, that brooder in, maybe we're keeping it in the house or someplace that's more climate controlled, be very careful that we're monitoring that temperature that it doesn't get too warm. Um, I have seen a few cases where people thought they were doing the right thing. They had the heat lamp in there and they were roasting their poor chicks because it was just too warm in there for them. So I have some good tips on how to make sure that we don't do that. Finally, anything we choose for a brooder, we need to make sure that it's easy to clean, that our chicks can't get feet caught in the sides, that they can't get out. Um, wood shavings or pine shavings are a really common substrate. Keep those clean, remove and replace as needed. Um, sometimes for the first day or two, people will use like a newspaper or a flat paper towel, um, just something that's got some, some texture to it that they can grab onto, but that isn't tripping them as they kind of learn to walk at first. Avoid things like hay, straw, anything super stemmy that's gonna be really hard for the chicks to walk through. Think about the size of a chick, very tiny, versus the size of some of the, that fluffy hay, how hard it would be for them to move around in it. And also avoid leaving them like on the bare plastic or, or anything slick. We don't want them, them sliding around. They can get what's called splay leg. And finally, cleanliness is key here. Um, one of the biggest issues that we see in young chicks is called coccidiosis, and I'm going to talk a little bit more about that. But keeping a clean and dry brooder goes a long way towards preventing that as a problem. So chicks do need supplemental heat until they have all of their feathers in. Um, when they first arrive, nine, when they're one day old, um, about 95 degrees is what we want the brooder at. 
And then we can reduce that temperature by about five degrees each week until those chicks have all their feathers in. And that, that usually takes eight to 10 or so weeks. Um, if you choose to use a heat lamp, which is the most common thing, please use extreme caution. There have been a lot of fires caused because of these heat lamps. And I have a whole slide on heat lamp safety here in a second. They also make these little heating pads um, like this guy right here. And then these little brooder, whatever they call them, brooder heating panels. I think this is the Brincia Eco Glow one. These work really well too. They just provide some radiant heat and they actually raise as the chicks grow so that they can just fit underneath them, kind of acting like a mama hen would. Um, and the nice thing about those is that you don't have the dangers of fire like you do with a heat lamp. Um, however, with those pads and those heating panels, you do need to be a little more conscious um, about what the ambient temperature is. Um, they just don't overcome extreme ambient cold temperatures like a heat lamp will. So those would be perfect if you're keeping chicks someplace a little more climate controlled or protected um, rather, than, rather than someplace outside where a heat lamp might be a better choice. Um, this is my, my heat lamp PSA. You see these clamps right here? I feel like these things were designed to fail. I would never, ever, ever hang a heat lamp by a clamp. If you buy one with that clamp, take it off and throw it away. This ring on the back is a much better choice. And for my own peace of mind and security, I actually usually tie through this and I tie the cord up too, so that I have two points keeping that heat lamp. Um, this is a very hot surface on this bulb. These get really warm. We have birds that can be flying around, jumping around. They get little weird jumping things they like to do because they get excited. They can knock into this, knock it over. And generally, what do we have on the bottom of the brooder? Highly flammable pine shavings. Um, so please be very cautious if you have to use a heat lamp. Don't use the clamp and make sure you have at least two points of attachment to make sure that that heat lamp cannot fall. Um, some other best practices, uh, use a lower wattage bulb. So they make different sizes. The 250 watt bulb is what's actually designed to go in them. That is far too hot, particularly if you're keeping birds in the house. Um, I would recommend only using that 250 watt bulb if you have an especially large brooder. If you have your chicks outside or someplace else not climate controlled, like maybe a shed or something. Um, for most brooder situations, a 125 watt bulb is gonna be more than sufficient. And if the brooder is in the house, you may even only need a 100 watt incandescent bulb, maybe plenty of heat. So some reliable ways on how to tell if your brooder is too hot or too cold. Got a couple of options for you. So option one, we can take a look at brooder temperature and bird distribution. So the way that those chicks behave in the brooder is gonna give us some good keys onto if it's too hot or too cold. So that number one spot right there, this is the, the correct temperature. You see our chicks are sort of, pretend the little blue squares are chicks. They're sort of evenly spaced around the brooder, under the light, they're not huddled together, they're not all on one side. That's what we're looking for. If our temperature is too low, meaning that those chicks are too cold, they're gonna huddle up right underneath that heat source and try to be um, as close together as possible. That means it's too cold, they're just too cold. If it's drafty, if there's a draft blowing through, you're gonna see them kind of huddled kind of off to one side, trying to get out of that draft, but also kind of wanting to be warm. And finally, number four, temperature too high. The, these birds are trying to get away from this heat source. They're spread all the way out to the edges. It's just too hot for them. The other thing you can do is you can actually listen to the chicks. Um, happy chicks that are comfortable will sort of have this low level, sort of constant, pleasant little chirping going on. If you start to hear really loud, really insistent, cheap, 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 super loud, obnoxious, that usually means that they are something wrong. Either something is bothering them, it's too cold, it's too hot, we're out of water, there's a cat staring at me through the roof, something like that, that means it's time to check on them. And oftentimes, temp if the temperature is, is not quite right, you'll hear that, that uncomfortable cheeping sort of noise. So just some pictures so you can see, these chicks are too hot. They're not directly under, they're not spread out. They're all kind of trying to get as far away from that heat source as they can. And these chicks are too cold. They're huddled up under that heat source. Most of them huddled together pretty tightly trying to warm back up. These chicks are way over in the corner trying to get out of a draft. 
And here's what we're looking for. We're going to pretend these are chicks. I know they're ducks, but we're going to pretend they're chicks. Um, they're sort of gently spread out. Um, I know you can't see the other half of the brooder, but they're sort of gently spread out throughout the entire brooder. They're not all huddled together right under the light trying to stay warm. So this is one of the other key things that you can do. These, these have come down in, tech, in price significantly recently. Um, I bought these little Gobi Bluetooth sensors on Amazon, and I think they were maybe only $20 or $30 a piece, and I only, you only need one. Um, they're just a little Bluetooth sensor, and all I did was hang it in my brooder, um, not directly under my light, but sort of maybe just right off to the side of where my heat source was. Um, and then you can check that app on your phone. It'll sync to your phone via Bluetooth, and it will actually do a really good job of monitoring temperature um, quite often. And then it's really easy to check if you have big temperature fluctuations that might occur when you're not around. Maybe in the middle of the night, um, you have a big temperature swing and it gets really cold and you just don't know that. But with this, you can actually look at the app and let me show you what the app looks like. And you can see where the temperature dropped. This one is actually just on my back porch right now because I don't have any chicks at the moment. Um, but you can see we had two really cold nights a few nights ago. Um, where the temperature dropped, that red is where I had set a level where it will tell me that it's below, I think I have it set at 32. Um, and so I can actually look and see, and I can zoom in and look at it by the hour, by the day. I can zoom out and look at it by the week, month, or year, um, and get a really good picture of what that brooder temperature is doing throughout the day. So I highly recommend these. Um, like I said, this was the Govee brand on Amazon. There's a bunch of other brands. Any of them should work just fine. Um, the nice thing is it's Bluetooth, so there's no fees or anything to pay. It doesn't use cell signal or anything like that. Um, it's just, you just need to be in vicinity of it in order to sync the app um, with the little device. Um, so you can't check it while you're not home, but um, it will pull data for continuously. So now that we've talked about sort of brooder setup, let's talk a little bit about feeding our baby chicks. Um, and I'm going to go a little bit more into this when we get into the nutrition side of this talk. Um, but let's start with ch chicks real quick. What do chicks eat? Chicks eat chick starch. So this is generally um, a commercially made, um, it'll be a crumble or generally a mash actually for the baby chicks. Um, it'll be super fine. Um, this is a commercial ration that's been formulated by professionals to meet all the needs that these chick chicks have as they're growing. And it's really important because chick start is not the same as laying hen feed. Um, First, it has 20% crude protein, which is more crude protein than most laying hen feeds, but not all of them. And they need that crude protein to really help them grow properly during their first weeks of life. Um, chick start also doesn't contain the large amounts of calcium that a laying hen feed does. Um, laying hen feed does have that extra calcium because those hens are using that calcium to lay eggs. But at this stage in a chick's life, that extra calcium would actually be very detrimental to them um, and will interfere with some of their bone growth. It, they'll, you'll end up with some problems um, and also in their kidneys as they try to process all that extra calcium. Um, so it's better that we don't give them that right away. And then the, there's also, um, it comes in medicated and non-medicated versions. Um, and which one you're gonna pick is personal preference. The medication in it is called emprolium. And emprolium is a coccidiostat, meaning it will stop coccidiosis from growing um, in chickens that are being fed this feed. It's very safe. Um, you're going to pull them off of this um, before they start laying eggs. There's no problem with feeding it if you choose. You don't have to. You can choose not to feed it. And the biggest, um, I, I guess the biggest question is going to be, were your chicks vaccinated for coccidiosis? And that vaccination has to be given to them basically as soon as they're hatched. And it's something that the hatchery will do before they ship your chicks. Not every hatchery does it or not every hatchery does it for every chick. So it's really important that when you purchase your chicks, you try to find out if they've been vaccinated or not. So if they have been vaccinated, you don't need to feed the medicated feed. They've received that vaccine and they should not have a problem with coccidiosis. If they have been back or have not been vaccinated, it's really recommended to feed that medicated feed. Um, and also very, very, very important to keep that brooder as scrupulously clean as possible because coxie is one of those diseases that is spread and thrives in those damp, dirty, dank environments like a wet, dirty brooder, okay? If your chicks were vaccinated and you don't know, it is perfectly fine to feed the medicated feed. You are not gonna hurt anything by doing that. You're not gonna, you're not gonna interrupt the vaccine process. You just fed it when you didn't need to is the only difference. 
So the coxie life cycle, actually most flocks and chickens have this organism living in them at a low level. They just have enough of an immune system that they're resistant to it and it doesn't grow enough to cause a problem unless the chicken gets overly stressed by something else um, or, or for whatever reason, the environmental load grows really big, maybe because we don't have a clean coop or something like that. So it lives in the infected birds, they shed it in their feces. Um, and what happens is that these really young birds or chicks are very susceptible because they don't yet have an immune system to this oocyte, to this little parasite. Um, and so they get these really gross off color bloody droppings, they get very inactive, they get very lethargic, they just don't feel good. Um, but it's highly treatable with this medicated product like Ampolium, um, and it's perfectly fine to feed that medicated chick start to our young chicks to help sort of head this off while they're growing and developing that immunity. And so finally, as we set up that brooder, we wanna make some considerations for feed and water for these young chicks. Um, as I mentioned, that clean, dry brooder is really key. So making sure we provide water in one, a safe way so that um, chicks aren't drowning in it. Chicks are really um, have a hard time getting out of big containers of water. So chick, um, chick waterers really need to be designed in such a way that chicks can't get in them and, um, and not be able to get back out again. So we, we tend to use things like these here that have this little skinny ring around it, the cups that um, I think I've got some nipples on the next one. We just wanna avoid just putting a big tub of water in there though, where the chick could get in and not be able to get back out. Um, we also wanna avoid this situation here. Um, as you see, these get really dirty really fast. Bedding gets kicked into them. Um, manure gets kicked into them. And that's another quick and easy way to spread coxie. Remember it is spread through those fecal droppings. And so if they end up in the water, they've now contaminated the water for everybody else. Um, I am a big fan of these little nipple drinkers. Um, you can actually make them for your chicks really easy. You can buy the little nipples, they're only a couple bucks. And then use something that has a flat lid or a flat bottom, like a little bucket. Um, the little half gallon milk containers, like the Fairlife milk containers work really well. Um, I, my cold brew coffee container actually works phenomenally well because it has a really flat lid. And you just drill a hole. Um, it tells you on the little nipple what size hole to drill. Thread that baby up in there um, and actually poke a hole in the top. You, these do not work off of a vacuum like the rabbit bottles do. Um, they actually just have to push that little um, lever up and water will come out. There's a little bit of a learning curve to train them to use it. But the benefits are that you don't have water that's being contaminated by droppings, being contaminated by bedding, potentially being spilled everywhere. Um, and once they've learned how to use it as chicks, they transition very well to using them as adult hens. And it's a really nice way to make sure that your flock always has very clean water. There's also these little cups, which work a little differently down here. They also have a little nozzle in them. I have not used those before myself, but I know that some people do like them and they do work very well. And they're very similar to the little nipple ones. They just need a little training to learn how to use them and then they're good to go. So now that we've kind of talked about our chicks, about setting up the brooder, making sure they have appropriate waters, those sorts of things, um, let's talk about chicken nutrition. Um, and what I wanna do is kind of go through the, the sort of key components of nutrition. And then I wanna go through what some of the different products that we have available to us are and when we should maybe use those. So let's start with water because we were just talking about water anyway. Um, this is the most important nutrient. It is the one that we need to make sure that chickens have in front of them at all times. Um, as a general rule, they will consume twice as much water as feed. They'll probably consume um, a, a cup and a half or more per day, and maybe even more than that if it's especially hot out. Um, and also, blankets tend to drink about a quarter of their daily water in the last two hours of daylight. So making sure, especially that our waters are filled at the end of the day, is really critical. Um, the way chicken's digestion works is they actually fill this little um, pouch kind of sits right there in their breast called a crop. And you've probably seen it protruding sometimes when it's really full. Um, and that sort of acts as a holding place for feed. Um, and, and it just sort of sits there until it's able to get through the rest of the digestion process. And so they drink a bunch of water at the end of the day because at, at night they process whatever feed is left in that crop. And so they need that water to push everything kind of through. 
Um, the next sort of major component of nutrition is what's called carbohydrates. This is, this is basically energy. This is the thing that they use to do things. So sugars, starches, um, and fibers. This is really the largest portion of the poultry diet. They, they eat the most of these more than anything else. Corn, barley, or other cereal grains um, are really key things that provide this. Chickens do not digest fiber very well. So that would be things like hay, hay stems. They just don't, they're not a ruminant animal, not like a cow that has that big fermentation bad. They just don't function that way. Um, and so they really struggle. So the grains are really key to having in their diet. Proteins, um, these are really important for um, everything that the chicken's body does. This is the building blocks of things like muscles, nerves, cartilage, feathers, all those sorts of things. So amino acids are what make up proteins um, and making sure that we have an adequate amount of protein in the diet for all life stages is really important. So we often see on the feed tag label, we'll see 20% um, CP or crude protein. And what that means is that's the minimum protein that is in that feed. And so that higher protein level we'll see for a few reasons in growing chicks. And then as they get sort of more towards adult size, we can back that protein level back down a little bit. I think it's really important to think about increasing that protein level again when chickens are going through something like a heavy molt. During that time, they're, they're shedding their old feathers and they're getting new ones grown in. And those feathers are really composed very heavily of protein. And so providing them some extra protein during that time is really, really helpful um, to help them get through that molting process and get back to laying eggs a little bit faster. Finally, there's fats. Um, chickens don't consume a ton of fat, but they do have it in their diet and it is necessary for things like cell membrane integrity. So making sure that those cells are able to retain their shape and keep in and out um, fluids and other things that they want to do. Hormone synthesis is, um, most hormones are types of fats or fat composed. Um, linoleic acid is probably the most important fat for a bird to have in their diet. And it's good to know they cannot be synthesized by the bird. Some of the other um, acids we see in birds, they, they can actually synthesize them back and forth from each other. Linoleic, they can't, they must consume that as part of their diet. Vitamins required in very small quantities, but very, very important. Um, vitamin A, D, and K in particular, these are what's called fat soluble vitamins, meaning they, they need to be ingested with fat in order for them to absorb them. And then vitamin C and B are both water soluble. But vitamins, they don't really store long term. They really need a fairly steady supply of these every day. And if they're deficient in any of these, it can cause a lot of Ill, different illnesses and conditions. There are so many we could go into. But the big thing to note, it's, it's really especially difficult to balance these vitamins and also our minerals while also balancing those macros, the carbs, the fats, and the proteins at the same time. And finally, we have minerals. These are inorganic compounds, really important in bones, in blood, and then especially those macros. Calcium in particular is the one we pay a lot of attention to in our laying hens. The, basic component of an eggshell is calcium. And if a chicken is not consuming enough calcium in her diet to lay good, strong eggshells, we'll see a couple of things that could happen. Number one, her eggshell quality will start to decline. We'll get eggs that when we grab them to pick them up, they'll break very easily. They'll crack something along those lines. Um, and also what will happen is she could start mobilizing her own calcium stores. The other place that chickens need calcium is for their bones. It's a heavy component of bones in all animals. And she'll actually start mobilizing calcium out of her own bones to put into the eggshells. And we wanna make sure that we avoid having that happen. So it's really important that we make sure that she's getting an adequate amount of calcium in her diet. So those layer feeds are fortified with extra calcium. That's really important for those hens in production. Um, and in many cases, it's advisable to supply some extra calcium on the side in the form of oyster shell, we can also feed back crushed eggshells. If you save your eggshells and dry them and crush them, you can feed those back too. Um, it's important to note that those grains are low in minerals and all of the chicken diets that are formulated um, have added minerals to adequate levels in all of them. Um, and here's that digestive system I was talking about. So they ingest their food, it goes down. The first thing it goes into is this giant crop right here on the front, sort of like a holding chamber. And from there, we'll go down um, and we'll end up in what's called the proventriculus, which is really, you can think of that like a real stomach. 
um, similar to ours and what it does um, in terms of having the acids and those types of things. And then it will continue on down into what's called the gizzard. And if you've ever eaten chicken gizzards, that's what you've eaten. Um, this is a really, really heavily muscled organ that contains what's called grit. The chickens will eat uh, small stones, pebbles, things like that, that will end up in the gizzard and it will actually mechanically help grind and break down um, further those grains and things that they've consumed. And then we continue on into the small intestine, which is similar to what ours does in terms of um, helping to absorb the nutrients that the chicken has then, that, that was in the food that the chicken ate. And then this, the large intestine, which is actually very similar um, to the small intestine in the chickens. Um, and they also have this little, what's called a cica. If you have horses, you would, you would know it as a cica. Um, but it does the same thing as a little blind in sac that they do a very small amount of fermentation in, very small amount. So when we talk about laying hens, when you walk into the feed store, there's a huge variety in front of you. So I'm gonna kind of give you just some information on kind of basically what these fall into as categories and what they are sort of for. And then we're gonna go through, um, we're gonna go through kind of a, a life cycle of a, a chick and what you should feed from chick to hen, just so you kind of understand. So let's start with that chick starter. Generally, those are 18 to 20% crude protein. Again, they come in that medicated or non-medicated form. This is what you would feed to chicks from week one, from the, from the day you get them, until they're six to eight weeks old. Um, or some people will continue to feed this all the way up through their first eggs. There's nothing wrong with that. It's not gonna hurt anything. Then you have what's called a pull, pullet grower or developer. Um, and this is what you can start feeding your, your pullets that you're raising from about six to eight weeks of age until about 20 weeks or until about 75% of the, the, the pullets that you have are laying eggs. Um, that, that's just a little lower protein, but, but still very similar to that chick start in that it's designed to help those birds continue to grow their own bodies without providing them with an excess of calcium. Once you have about 75% of your group of pullets um, laying eggs, you can actually switch them to a layer feed. These, comes, these come as crumbles, as pellets. Sometimes you can find them as mash, or you can find them as a textured feed where, they, where they've left the grain components sort of together and they haven't, they haven't homogenized the mix. Um, 16 to 18% protein. You can even find a few that are a little higher that are maybe designed to be fed during a molt. Um, these contain a lot of calcium to help those hens maintain that good eggshell quality and egg production um, and to be healthy while doing it. You may also see what's called an all flock feed. Um, this is designed for adult birds in mixed flocks. So maybe you have some that are not laying. Uh, maybe you have some other species of birds in there with your chickens. So you can actually provide this so that you are not overloading those other birds with calcium and provide a free choice oyster shell on the side for those laying hens. Um, scratch grains. This is when I see a lot of confusion over. Scratch grains are treats. They are not feed. Okay, they do not have the balanced micro minerals, they do not have the balanced vitamins, they do not have the balanced minerals, they do not have um, the balanced macro minerals necessary to support um, actual growth and development and good laying and good health in your birds. Okay, so these are a treat. We call it, we affectionately call it chicken crack at my house, but it is not chicken feed. Grit is really important. Most chicks, chicks, chickens, if they're allowed to free range, are able to get grit on their own and you don't need to supply it. If they're allowed access to soil where they can scrape and pick up little stones and pebbles, they're, they're going to be fine. You may need to supply grit if you have chickens that are stuck somewhere where they don't have access to soil. Maybe your coop is designed that way. Or if you have young chicks in a brooder and you want to give them treats outside of their chick um, starter, which I'm going to talk about in a second you will need to supply them with chick grit, okay? And then oyster shell is something that you can buy as an additional source of calcium for egg quality. Um, you can provide that free choice on the side as well. It is important to note that if you are supplying both grit and oyster shell, don't mix them in with your feed. Supply them in separate dishes off to the side, okay? Because you want them to just take what they need and not be forced to eat it because it's mixed in with the feed. That makes sense. Um, and then if you need some extra protein to supply, we talked a little bit about that, like maybe during a molt, 
they might need a little extra protein. You can either just buy a slightly higher protein feed for that time frame, or you could provide something like scrambled eggs. I wouldn't provide raw eggs because you don't want to teach them to eat raw eggs, but scrambled eggs are a perfectly fine thing to feed them um, to provide extra protein. Um, also things like mealworms and soldier fly larvae. And also you probably need more chick start than you think you do. So here's some quick feed requirements. These are based on 50 pound bags. So if you're raising replacement pullets for egg production, so you have 25 chicks that you have purchased and you are planning to raise up to lay eggs. Um, if they're the, any of those dual purpose type breeds, the Rhode Island Reds, the Plymouth Barred Rocks, any of those, you're gonna go through about nine bags of chick start, nine 50 pound bags to raise those birds from baby chicks all the way through to their first eggs. So that's quite a bit more than what you would think. So if you're only raising, let's say you're only raising 12, because that's half, then you would probably need four to five bags. Just still quite a few bags. And then for our adult hens in full egg production, if we have 25 hens, which is probably a lot, of those same dual purpose type hens, you're probably gonna go through four to four and a half bags, 50 pound bags of layer feed per month. Okay, so those are just some numbers to keep in mind when we're talking about how much feed we're gonna go through. And then that quick, easy feeding by age. Let's start with our chicks. Those chicks, when we bring them home from day one, they're gonna go in the brooder and they're gonna get chick start free choice only. That is the only thing they need. If a few weeks later you want to start including some small amounts of treats, I'm a big fan of the mealworms. Um, this can really help with training and taming them and getting them a little calmer and used to being handled. Um, if you do this, you do need to make sure you supply them with grit and I would always keep those treats to a very small portion of the diet. Once we have those growing pullets, once they hit about six to eight weeks of age, we can either continue with chick start or we can switch them to that pullet grower or developer until about 75% of them are laying eggs. And then we can switch right over to that laying hen diet and that's what they can stay on for the rest of their life. Um, again, add that free choice oyster shell on the side if you think it's necessary. Um, and I would not feed scratch grains to growing chickens. Again, that's a treat, not a feed. Um, it's not a balanced ration. It doesn't have the right um, combinations of micronutrients and stuff in it. And we don't want them to preferentially eat that. It's like feeding your kid ice cream and then expecting them to eat their meal. Um, we want them to eat their meal first kind of deal. Um, we can give our chickens some of our table scraps. They do a really great job of helping you clean out the fridge if you've got some old veggies. They like veggies in all forms, shredded carrots, um, even some fruits. They aren't a big fan of citrus, I found, but like blueberries and stuff, strawberries. Um, any sort of cooked leftover, leftover vegetables are also fine. Again, those mealworms and soldier fly larvae are a good protein. And if you do do things like weeds from the garden or lawn clippings, just be cautious that you have not used herbicides or pesticides on those um, and just be careful that you write correctly identified whatever you're giving them that it's not something that's toxic like burrowweed or something like that. And I would always keep these things in relatively small amounts and maybe feed them a little bit later in the day so the chickens have had a chance to consume actual food first. Um, chickens who eat too many treats are prone to obesity, sour crop, which is like a fungal infection in their crop, um, crop impaction where it literally gets so impacted that food cannot pass through. Um, and malnutrition from not eating enough layer feed and eating too many goodies. Um, avoid long stemmed fibers, things like Bermuda hay, that kind of stuff. If they do, first of all, they probably won't eat it, but if they do, it can actually become wadded up in the crop and really lead to impaction. We always wanna make sure we're storing our feed in such a way um, that it's not gonna be invaded by mice or rodents um, or in, in the winter time or full of rain or anything like that away from moisture. Once one bag is open, pour it into or put it into a clean container with a tight fitting lid, um, cool dry place, use up all the feed before opening another bag, um, rotate feed. So don't just keep pouring new feed on top of old feed, dump the old feed, put the new feed and then put the rest of the old on top so it gets used first. If you're feeding free choice, you need to have enough feeders to allow about a third of your flock to eat at a time. If you're restricting feed, meaning you're not you're only feeding them what they will eat in a day, you need to have enough feed for enough feeders for all your birds to eat. 
um, at the same time. If you're limit feeding, plan on about three quarters cup of food, about a quarter of a pound per bird per day as a baseline, adjust up or down as you need to. Um, and be sure you're spreading that out and you have all those feeding spots so that everybody has a really has a fair shake of getting all the feed that they need. Um, this is really not an ideal way to do it, but it does work. And then we did talk about chickens potentially drawing in rodents. Um, there's a few ways to combat that. Number one is to do that limit feeding where you only feed them what they are supposed to be getting and no more. Um, you could also free feed, but pull those feeders at night. So let's say you're putting feed out in pan, dish pans or whatever. Just every time you go out there in the evening, pick up all the feed pans so that rodents who tend to come out at night and the chickens are roosting anyway, they're not down eating at night. Um, that way the, the rodents just can't get at it. Um, or you could try some sort of a rodent proof feeder. This is actually one that I have called a rat proof feeder. Um, they make all kinds of these treadle feeders. And the nice thing about them is that they, that door swings closed and it only opens when a chicken stands on the treadle to open the door to eat. It takes a little bit of training. It took me about a day and a half to get my flock eating out of this treadle feeder. Um, but it's really, really nice in that it closes itself and I don't have to worry about picking feet up and the rats cannot get into it. Um, you may have to use caution if you're introducing some young birds or you have some much smaller chickens in your flock. Um, if they're standing on the treadle and a bigger chicken is and they're not heavy enough to weight it down and the big chicken gets off, it will, the door will close on them and will have a hard time eating. But as long as all your chickens are big enough to activate the feeder, then everything should be fine. And finally, we're gonna end on water again because I cannot impress upon you how important clean water is to your brooder health and to your flock. Um, it serves many functions, the transport of nutrients, helping to cool those chickens down, especially in the summertime, you will see a big increase in water consumption, which is how they cool them, one of the ways that they help to cool themselves since chickens don't sweat. And maybe that's a, a topic we need to think about adding is heat stress. Um, if a hen goes without water for 24 hours, it will take her about 24 hours to recover and you will see a big drop in egg production um, for a few days after that even. So keeping those chickens well watered is very important. And I believe that is the end of it. So we are trying to link things onto these two poultry websites. Um, there's not a whole lot up there yet, but we're getting some things up there. So those are, just keep checking back and, and you can always um, email me and let me know if there's other things that you wanna see up there um, or other information that you need and I'm happy to help. The link we put on earlier that mission.arizona.edu um, slash poultry, if you go there, there's some more articles, there's short videos. Ashley shows you how to create a nipple water drinker with those, um, a really great YouTube video. Um, for my first aid kit, um, the things that I would include would be like an electrolyte mix or an electrolyte drench. That's really important during the summertime when it's hot, if we have a chicken that's going into heat stress. Um, they, make, they make that stuff um, specifically for chickens. It's really easy to get. Um, I'm trying to find, there was, there was actually a kit that was already made that I wanted to share with you guys and I can't find it. I would keep things like some wound disinfectant. Um, some wound disinfectant would be a really good one. Something that is good for chickens, things like um, a chlorhexidine solution or a betadine solution. We can use both of those. Um, Epsom salts for treating things like bumblefoot, um, similar to getting the abscess out of a horse hoof. Um, Epsom salts are really good for that. Some bandaging type materials, nonstick gauze pads, things like vet, vet wrap or coflex. I don't know if you know what those are. They're like um, a stretchy sticks to itself wound bandage. You would put the gauze on if you had a wound and then wrap however you needed to wrap the chicken to make it work. And it's really stretchy, it sticks to itself. Scissors, tweezers, um, gloves. Um, what else I would put in there? Um, styptic powder, if you have to trim a toenail and you hit it and you can't get it to stop bleeding. In the winter, in the summertime, um, for me, especially because I'm in Southern Arizona, this may not be as big a deal for you guys up North, um, is making sure that I'm prepared for heat stroke um, in my chickens. Um, that's probably the biggest thing that I battle is heat stroke. So I keep a bucket of cool water, not icy cold, but cool water available um, so that if I catch a chicken who's going into heat stroke, I can, I can drench her put her in the bucket of water, let her get kind of cooled off. Um, 
they make what's called a chicken saddle. Um, it's like a little chicken, or they call it a chicken apron sometimes. A couple of those are handy. Um, that way you can kind of block, it's, it's better than the blue coat. It will help block if they have um, they're missing feathers or wounds on their back. It will stop the other chickens from picking at them. They look really silly wearing them or sometimes adorable depending on how you feel. They are a pain in the butt to put on, but they do work. Okay, we've given you so much information tonight. Uh, it was great, Ashley. Anybody else? Thank you very much for joining us tonight. We hope you learned a lot. But thank you very much. Thank you, Ashley, for joining us. Thanks, everyone. And everyone, you have a great night and be safe. We'll see you next month.